Today, we're going to look at the labs from uh, chapter nine. Um, I went through these, um, like the first half, I kind of adapted what Emil has for the tidy models lab version of the labs to use the exact same data as the book so that we could, if you're like re following along in the book, it won't be totally different. I understand why he changed it, or actually he might be using the following the old uh, first edition, I'm not sure, um, but I wanted to be able to, to see it side by side. And so basically what I did is I ran everything for the first part of the lab in the old format so that I would have the same um, random number seeds when, we, when they generate the test data, saved that out and then started at the top. So um, hopefully this will be kind of useful. It was nice to, to walk through and like, um, you know, set everything up. It's not a full tidy models implementation because he doesn't do anything with a recipe, but it's still, he does do, you know, cross fold validation. It's nice to walk through. All right, so we start by creating um, some simulated data. Again, I just create it the same way that they create it so that it's the same numbers so that it looks the same. Well, inside of that matrix, at least it's the same. And then uh, the difference being that we wrap it in a tibble and, uh, you know, use tidy methods to update it. But the idea is we are creating a 20 random points and then 10 of them we set as negative one and 10 of them we set as one. And the ones that are one, we add one to those so that there is a like fairly clear distinction between them. But um, I think I have, yeah, if we look at the actual points, um, there's this guy here that causes it that there's not an absolute clear way. There's no line that you can draw that will 100% uh, divide them into two sets. Um, and again, I did the same points as them so that you know everything will match up so that when you look at this, it is the same points. And you can see what the differences are between this and if you do the book version. Um, so yeah, and then I also generate the, or load the test data right here, which is just um, generated basically the same way, the exact same process actually, but different numbers because it's a different set of random numbers, a uh, different seed. Um, and so you can see the test data actually even a little bit more so has uh, some messiness in it, but it's generated using the same process. So it should be, you know, the same, like if they belong to the same population because they're generated using the same process. Um, so that's a, an interesting way to set up some simulated data. All right. And then we get to the, the difference between tidy models and base or the way that they have it in the book is we create a spec that we then can just tweak uh, for all the little different ways that we're looking at it. So the spec for the specification for the model is just an SVM uh, poly, but the polynomial degree is one. So that means it's aligned. Um, we set the mode to classification and we're going to use this Kern lab engine. Um, and that, so that's all set up. And then uh, in the book, they did these manual fits. So we're going to do the same manual fits where we just set a cost. Uh, so if we set the cost to 10 and we look at the fit, uh, the important part is it's got seven support vectors and training error of 0.15, which means 0.15 out of 20 is three errors. Um, and we can plot that with the auto plot for this Kern lab, which I think is um, terrible. <laughs> like it doesn't show that much, but this is what the auto plot method is. So it shows you the three errors um, in this case. It's not always the errors that it shows. I'm, I think like it's trying to show you something about how the um, SVM is set um, or is determined, but it doesn't show all seven support vectors and it doesn't always just show the errors. So I didn't dig in enough to see, okay, but what is it showing then? Um, so that part, actually the base version of this shows you all of the plot points and then highlights the ones that are the um, used to define the SVM. Uh, I think that the base auto plot is better, but it was too much of a pain to uh, try to make that the same. So this is what we've got. Um, and that's something, I don't know, uh, it, 
whenever I have to use an auto plot, you know, just plot from some package, it makes me realize that um, there's a reason that I like using ggplot because I, can, I don't even know where to start to fix this. Like it's just, an, I'd have to extract the points out of the fit and, you know, it's a whole mess. So that's that. All right. Um, anyone have any, any thoughts or questions before I, I move on from here? All right. All right. So then next they did a uh, 0 0.1 cost. Um, and we look at that and it has more support vectors and a lower training error. It only gets one of them wrong. And so again, if we plot it, uh, this isn't all 16. Yeah, it's 13 out of the 16 support vectors. So again, I don't really understand this auto plot method. If anyone um, dug in and knows what it's doing, I don't know, but if you look at it, so these three points are these three points. So it's not even on the same scale. It's hard to compare, but you can kind of see um, that the the support or the whatever the classification, the margin is different. Um, and then I also did zero point zero one because we're going to look at that later, and so I set that up, and that one has uh, twenty support vectors, and it's got five errors. Um, and again, it, another plot. Um, those are those three that are in all three. Um, you can see here actually that the margin moved, I think, quite a bit. Like, um, yeah, this these two plots were within the margin before, and now the margin moved over. Um, so you can kind of see the difference between those. All right. So then we tune. And this is again, this is but where is it, are the points that showing John all the support vectors basically? Well, kind of, except it's not all of them. Like there, there are probably like 17 points on this one, something like that. Um, this one has 13 points. And that's there what are... I mean. Is it the support? Is it the ones that end up being the support vectors? Oh, it says so. So you, <laughs> it's like some of the support vectors. I don't, I really, I didn't dig in enough to understand why it chooses the, the auto plot that it does, because the only, uh, at first I was like, are there plots or are there points that are over plotted? So right, these 13 right. points are actually unlikely, all 16, right. but it's not. Yeah. And yeah. like, especially, you know, this one, there are not four, you know, there are seven support vectors and it shows three points. I really don't understand um, how it decides what to show in the auto plot. I started to dig in deeper to try to make it not bad, but I, I couldn't, I don't know, I couldn't find it basically. And I didn't, uh, didn't want to take that much time on it. Yeah. It's just, it's, uh, it's aggravating for sure. Because this is what's, I guess what makes it most aggravating is that this is a method that is so visual, like you're defining a line. And so the auto plot should show you that line <laughs> you know like it should it's it's the boundary <laughs> between those two faintest <laughs> yes <regions>. exactly <laughs> That's the line. yeah and, and it doesn't show you all of the support vectors now it could be something about what is being kept within the model but all 16 of those should be like part of the definition of the model effectively um so i don't know i don't uh do you remember last week when when Justin and I were going back and forth? He was talking about just being a a linear path, and he was we were making the connection. I said, you know, vector by definition is the straight line, and we were trying to figure out how to separate these. Do you think maybe it's something to do with maybe uh, the the model itself uh, excludes those points that uh, are are so far not even relevant that they don't. Paste them or they don't. That was my question too. But yeah. Then... But the thing is, these 16, according to the model, are relevant and it right. only shows 13 out of those 16. So there are three relevant points that it's not showing. What if it's off scale? Like it's it's not within your, your boundaries of this grub yeah, currently. Yeah, maybe the um maybe it chooses a certain range that contains, I don't know. Yeah, maybe those three points are way out. Let's see. Actually, now I'm a little curious because oh, not that one. This one. Um, so 
this, this, and this are the three points that show up all the time. This guy is probably one of the ones that always shows up and that is way outside. But again, why choose not? I don't like, so show that. <laughs> like, I don't know what you gain by not showing that. Um, anyway, so that was something I probably should have dug into it deeper to try to make these things uh, more meaningful. Um, but yeah, it, so that is like the main difference with the meals version that I noticed is he uses more points and it makes for um, nicer plots and the uh, of the uh, SVMs. But I did count them and it's still, it's like, it's a subset of the support vectors. So it's not, it's just harder to tell that it's a subset because there are more points. Um, I don't know. But anyway, so that's our three uh, SVMs that we manually create. But uh, the nice thing, and you know, both within the lab in the book and with tidy models, you can tune and find uh, the best fit or the best cost, not, um, which is how we fit in this case. So to do that in tidy models, we're going to create a workflow. We're going to add a model, which is that spec of our model. And instead of setting a specific cost, we set cost to be tuned. And that's the nice thing about tidy models is any parameters that your model has that tidy models has a way to deal with, um, which is should be actually all parameters can be because you just have to tune it. You have to define how you tune it. But you just set the cost to be tuned. Um, we're adding a formula because that's what we that's how we're defining these models. And then I set the seed to one, two, three, four, um, because that's what Emil used. I don't I don't think the book used one, two, three, four here, but whatever. So we're making our folds and then we make a regular grid for our cost um, with 10 levels. Um, in the book, they did, oops, wrong PDF. Uh, hold on just a second. They did some, they did a different set of values here and I'm not at the right page to find it but they so they also chose they chose a set of values to look at um and it should be close to those so if i look for yeah they do um 0 0.001 0 0.01 0.1 10 and 100 uh the regular grid that uh tidy model sets up is it's a little bit uh, slightly wider than that and it's um i don't know it's like uh that doesn't look natural log it's something else um i'm not sure exactly how it chooses that range but it's a a logarithmic um set so that they that you cover a wide area the idea would be like if i were really trying to perfectly tune this um Either I would use more points or I would do this tune and then do another tune in the area of the answer that I come up with. Um, because we come out, we do this, and um, the one that is uh, just below 0.1. So uh, the 0 0.0992 wins. And actually, the 0 0.315 does just as well, or at least really close to as well. Um, and so really, you might, you know, if you were doing this for a real model, you might want to tune with a grid that is centered around there to try to find the perfect cost. But then again, you know, define perfect. So <laughs> because you, you know, it could be you could overfit if you try to get the cost too perfect. Um, so and then again, in tidy models, you can just um, there's a function select best to pull the tuned uh, result out here we're using accuracy because again that's what we used in the book um, and then we finalize our workflow with that best cost and fit it so we take that svm linear final and fit with the simulated data um, and then we can again using tidy models we can just augment that fit with the test data and create a uh, confusion matrix where the truth is why the estimate is the prediction from the fit or from the argument rather. Um, and we come up with exactly the same uh, 
confusion matrix that they had in the book. Technically in the book, they used, I think 0.01 and we used 0.0097 or whatever. And that shows you why I'm saying probably isn't worthwhile to uh, further tune that because you can use about the same cost and you get the same result with this particular set of data at least. Um, they also compare it to, so that was about 0.01, they do 0.001. And again, we can see that that confusion matrix, um, I don't know how used you are to reading these, but this is like the diagonal, I'm sorry, the diagonal that and that are correct. And then these are correct in the two, or incorrect in the two ways that we can be incorrect. And so in the tuned one, we have a total of three errors. In the untuned one, we have a total of six errors. And actually it's interesting because you can see um, that it's kind of, it's pushed towards guessing negative one. So you can kind of imagine that the line moved whichever direction ever negative one is, which I think is the lower values. Um, so anyway, so that's that, that's the, that part of the lab. Any, any questions over all of that? All right. So then they take the that training set and make it um, <laughs> more like easier uh, just to show the concept. So what they're doing is they're adding again where before we had our y, our corrects or our whatever our one values and we had added one. Now we're adding 0.5 to push them apart further. So now they're linearly separated, separatable barely. Like you could draw a line through there, and you get all the reds in the bottom and the blues on the top. Um, and then they, in the book, they used a um, thousand for the cost versus, and, and that gets three support vectors with zero error. Um, <laughs> again, okay, so it chooses to show one point. Which point is it? I guess I could figure that out if I really tried, but it's hard to tell because there's no context. Um, so, uh, and then they do a cost of one. You get, you do have um, one error in that case with more support vectors. And again, okay, it's another another set of random points. Um, but what they you know point out is that sometimes, um, you know, it, sorry. Then we do the same thing to the test data to turn the test data into the linearly separated test data, and we use that fit on the set test data. Um, and when we use uh, the the high super high cost one, what it's doing is it's since the cost is so high, it's saying fit exactly like this data tells you to fit, basically. So this training data is right. This is the tr this is the true pattern, and so use that. We get three errors when we use that, and we get two errors when we use a lower cost because we aren't as overfit. Um, so yeah, that's the whole like first section of the lab. Um, it was nice, like using using Emil's stuff where he wrote it in tidy models, but he didn't exactly match the book. So it was kind of useful to go through and say, okay, but what happens, you know, how can we make it the same? Um, so I got my, my uh, hands a little bit dirtier than I might have otherwise. All right, but for the next part, um, I, I'm just using Emil's version because I wanted to focus on the tidy models and I started to rewrite it and I was literally just copying pasting and not changing anything. So I was like, um, I should probably just go over to his if I'm gonna do that. Um, so here it, we're gonna do the radial kernel in tidy models. Um, and so again, we generate so, some data with a, uh, Nonlinear class boundary, the idea being, you know, basically this is our blue in here, and anything outside of that circle is our red, roughly speaking. Um, yeah, so that's the general idea. He sets two classes, one and two in this case. Um, and then we're going to do a uh, radial basis function. So the tidy models function for that is SVM RBF for radial basis function. Um, and again, we're, you know, in mode classification and this engine kern lab, um, which is the default, um, SVM engine for tidy models. 
Um, and then, so we can do um, without any uh, specified cost, like using all the default parameters, we can do a fit and we can see it does, um, can mostly see that it does pretty good. So triangles are what's, you know, red, yeah, triangles are supposed to be red, dots are supposed to be blue. Um, it does a pretty good job finding uh, the pattern in there. And obviously out where there's no data, it happens to set that to blue, but we have no real way of saying what it should be out there. Um, so we, he then generalizes, he, he just does another random seed with the same generation uh, process and it does pretty well. And it was actually interesting because um, I did a little bit of work to try to like manually tune this, but Kern Lab is automatically doing a little bit of tuning on this. And I came up with exactly the same uh, output when I tuned it. So it's like, oh, okay, I'll just let, let Kern Lab do its thing in this particular easy, um, you know, randomly generated case. Um, in the book, so that is something that in the book, they tune the gamma parameter and there is no parameter named gamma and there's no parameter named um, whatever the book says gamma stands for. Um, there is a sigma parameter in Kern Lab in the um, radial basis function, which I think is the same thing. I didn't dig super deep into that, but that is something that I found interesting that it isn't defined quite the same way as the radial basis function in the book. So um, that's something to maybe look into more deeply. All right, so any thoughts on that before we move on? <laughs> All right. All right. So then the rock curve. Um, they have a whole like in the book. They go through def like having you write functions to define rock curves and to calculate the area under the curve or whatever. And um, instead, we can just use yardstick, and it's got a function that we can just do this with. So that's nice. Um, and what is it? It's a receiver operator characteristic curve. And it's basically a way of um, measuring. Um, it, it comes from literally like sending messages over a radio. And do they hear what you said properly? Do they write down what you said? Um, but it's you know does the uh, prediction match the the truth? Um, all right. So uh, we can you know again take this. Uh, uh, RBF fit that we just did and take the simulated data and then set up a rock curve on that. And it, he's showing, you know, the output of that, which is this curve. So if we take the rock curve and um, predict it or, and uh, plot it, auto plot it, um, this is your, your like trade off in uh, sensitivity and specificity. And so traditionally, you know, you take the area under that curve to see uh, uh, like um, how, how well your model is doing. So that's a common metric there. And again, in tiny models, we can just take rock -Oc, and that's, uh, you know, 92.5, 0.925, uh, which is uh, pretty good. So depending what you're trying to do, this model is probably good enough at predicting your random data. <laughs> now, some other things you might need to work harder to get it higher and you might in other cases you might not care if it's even that high so any questions so far all right and now we're going to look at um, some actual data so um, get out of the simulated data i'm pretty sure that this data set is actually true data i didn't go deep into where does this data come from um, but this is uh, gene expression measurements uh, across um, a, a bunch of, uh, you know, a bunch of measurements, basically. Um, I did find it interesting that the way he has this written um, is he needs to update it. I, I sent in a pull request for a couple of typos he had, but I didn't dig through and try to fix his, his code. Basically, it's that um, the, the con data is... Uh, missing unique column names 
and so he it's automatically setting them and and now you need to tell tibble to automatically do that in the as tibble but anyway um so he sets up the training and test data from the con data and um we have 63 observations with two or 63 Actually, I did not look at the data. Was that 63 rows and 20, 2,309 uh, columns? Um, and so we've got basically a whole bunch of uh, predictors to try to pull out meaning from. Um, and so uh, he says, you know, don't don't bother with a uh, radial kernel in this case. Let's let's work with a linear spec that we have set up way from before, but now we can um, give it different data than what we were using. And that's again the beauty of uh, tidy models is we just set up this spec, and the spec is true for a linear SVM. Then we're going to feed it data. Then we're going to give it costs. Then we're going to um, tell it what to uh, fit based on. All right, so we train that on the training data, um, augment that, and make a confusion matrix. And we can see it actually um, you know, is able to perfectly fit the training data, which is good. Um, but we want to actually look at the test data. And it does actually really well on the test data, too. Uh, um, well, I say, so he says um, it performs fairly well. A um, couple of misclassifications. Out of not that many, like your test data isn't very big here. So he didn't ever quantify this. Um, two out of the uh, 20, you know, I guess we were saying that was pretty good before. So I guess that's pretty good. But it's um, that could be bad. And it's also interesting because, you know, maybe, um, maybe class three and class two are similar. And so in, in that case, these errors aren't that big of a deal as well um and that's it that's the lab anyone have any any questions about any of that or any comments or concerns or cute dogs in the background that you need to introduce <laughs> your dog just walked through ryan <laughs> wait a second i didn't shut my door no i did not <laughs> that is that is Frankie. She is our youngest doodle. And uh, uh, yeah, she's the one that wanders throughout the house. Uh, <laughs> Winston, our oldest, just lays around. So it's my my youngest uh, just lays around a lot. He likes his bets. My old dog wants to be where everyone is. So, all right. Anything else? So uh, we, I talked about it in the channel, but just to have it here and on the video, um, we're going to take the next two weeks off because uh, the US and Europe and basically the rest of the world are going to get out of sync on daylight savings time for two weeks. And then we get back in sync um, at the end of all this. So let's not deal with that. Plus, Jonathan and I are unavailable next week. So it was easier to just let's get take this off. So, um, so yeah, we'll be back on the uh, 22nd with chapter 10 and I'm hoping Federica is available on that day. You've got an extra two weeks to prepare, so it'd be good. Um, and yeah, we've only got uh, a handful of chapters left. So it'll be interesting to see, you know, how this goes. All right, if that's it, I will see everybody in uh, two weeks or three weeks, sorry. So 29th, I said the 22nd, 29th, we're back. It's the 15th we're out and the 22nd we're out. Sorry, 29th we're back. See you then. <laughs>